How do folks? I'm Charlie Darkey Parkhurst, stagecoach driver for the Pioneer Stage Line. Most folks just call me One-Eyed Charlie. Now, normally you'd be riding on one of the finest coaches ever built, the Concord Coach. Why it stands eight foot tall, it's painted bright red with enormous yellow wheels. Pulled by a team of six, room enough for 21 passengers, baggage, mail, and money box. You'd be seeing some of the many wonders of the Sierra. Douglas firs that grow to the heavens, the deepest and bluest lake in all the land. Black bears, coyotes, mule deer, and eagles. We would climb to the highest summits and plunge down canyon roads. Now today, we're not gonna be taking that stage because we have a recent epidemic crawling across our country. And the president has said that no stages can go west. So I find myself holed up here in the Rice Hotel, which is just a little north of Mormon Station, reminiscing about the epidemic of 1867, the cholera epidemic. Now that you're here, I'd be happy to share some stories with you if you like. I'd be lying to you if I told you there ain't no danger associated with riding in a stage. Well, it's true that I'm one of the fastest and safest whips, even with the one eye, but that don't mean I'm immune to sticky situations. Well, there was this one time I, I was traveling along a road that I'd been over just the week before. The recent storm changed the landscape quite a bit, and the river was raging and rolling to the brim it was. And as I approached this bridge that I'd been over year in and year out, it presented itself to me in such a state of dilapidation and decay that I couldn't stand it. Yet, my craw gave me no indication of danger, so I cracked my whip over my team and I sent them forward onto the weathered and rotten structure. And we could feel and hear the boards creaking beneath the weight of the stage. And I turned to my passengers and I said, hang on everybody and I'll save what's left of ya. This provoked a great feminine scream from within the stage followed by the silence of a dead faint. Now, as I turned to look over my shoulder, I could see the supports of the bridge collapsing into the gap that was now filling with water. But thankfully, my horse's hooves gained solid ground and we continued on as if nothing had ever happened, yet in complete silence. Another time I was breaking down Carson Pass when my lead horse stumbled off the road. I bit down hard on my cigar and I held tight to them ribbons. And then my wheel hit an embankment and over I went. And as I was being drug along on my stomach, I continued to hang on to them ribbons and somehow I managed to steer those poor frightened beasts back onto the road. Well, my, my passengers was so grateful to be alive, they took up a collection and presented me with $20 which I promptly put towards a new suit of clothing as my favorite ones was now in shreds. Now, a, a runaway stage ain't the only danger you could face out there on the trail. Why, road agents could be hiding around every corner. If you was to hear the words, throw down the box, you'd be shivering in your boots because a stage not only carries passengers or baggage or mail, but it also carries bullion and payroll for the mines and mills of Virginia City. Along about the uh, time of the great rush to Washoe, there was a stage leaving Sacramento town, heading for the Comstock, and it had nothing more than a few passengers, some baggage, some mail, some supplies for the mines, oh, and about $20,000 in payroll for the miners of Virginia City. Now two road agents who'd been tipped off to the enormous value of this cargo, lay in wait at a robber's roost just above the town of Genoa. And sure enough, when the stage come around the corner, they halted the team, called for the box, and emptied the stage of all of its contents, including its passengers. But yet, they could not find the $20,000. It certainly wasn't in the mailbox. It was only when they saw a small barrel marked horseshoe nails and they opened it up and they discovered their treasure, 
and it was all in gold coin. The solution was to roll the barrel down the side of the hill. So they let the stage and the passengers continue on, and then they scampered down the side of the hill to attend to their treasure. Well, they could not carry the entire $20,000 in gold coin on their person, so they each took a thousand and buried the remaining 18 at the base of the largest pine tree they could find. For reasons unbeknownst to myself, they never returned to claim their treasure. But it was a miner on his deathbed in a Montana mining camp years later where he confessed to being one of these bandits. Boy, howdy, faster than you can say Jehoshaphat. That mining town emptied out, and they all commenced upon the town of Genoa with picks and shovels and began to dig up the base of every large pine tree they could find. They didn't find the money, though. That was about uh, 20 years later when a, a tremendous avalanche come barreling down Genoa Canyon, taken with it, trees and boulders and buildings and lives, as it were. Well, boy, howdy, those Genoans, they took up their picks and shovels once again and commenced to digging up the entire hillside above the town. And still, they didn't find the treasure. Well, folks, what I'm saying here is this. Next time you come to Genoa, bring along a pick and shovel. The treasure's still out there. Well, now old Charlie here, I only ever been robbed once in my life, and I made up my mind right there and then there ain't gonna be no second time. So when the notorious road agent by the name of Sugarfoot, named that on account of putting burlap sacks over his boots to disguise his tracks, when he halted my team and called for the box, I was having none of it. Well, I cracked my whip over my team and I sent them a bolting, and then I took my Colt revolver and I fired all six shots. Old Sugarfoot never robbed another stage. He now resides in Boot Hill, pushing up daisies. Well, some, uh, some drivers like myself, uh, they only ever been robbed once. But other drivers, like my good friend Baldy Green, seem to make a, a career of it. So much so, I was inspired to write a poem. I'd like to share part of it with you right now. It's called The Ballad of Baldy Green. Now I'll tell you all a story, and I'll tell it to you in song. I hope that it will please you, for it won't detain you long. It's about one of them old boys, so gallus and so fine, who used to drive the mails on the pioneer line. He was the greatest favorite that ever yet was seen. He was known about Virginia by the name of Baldy Green. And as he was driving out one night so lively and a boon, he saw three men jump in the road by the pale light of the moon. Two sprang for the leaders, while one his shotgun cocks. Saying, Baldy, we hate to trouble you, but we just pass us out the box. So he reached into the boot and said, take it, sirs, with pleasure. And out into the middle of the road went Wells and Fargo's treasure. And when they got their money box, they seemed quite satisfied. For the one who held the leader then politely stepped aside. Saying, Baldy, we got what we want, so drive along your team. And he made the quickest time to Silver City ever seen. True story. Well, then there were drivers like my good friend Hank Monk, who said he was never robbed once in his life. Hank, he's, he's known as the Jehu of the Sierras. Jehu is a biblical term. His driving is like the driving of Jehu, son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. He was such a skilled driver, Hank was, that he could turn a coach and a team of six with the ribbons slack in his hands. Now, he was a drinker. Yes, he was, and well, so was his favorite horse. But he never let that put any of his passengers in danger. Now, this one time, he was leaving Genoa. He had a full stage of passengers, and he was heading up to the lake. And as he approached the base of Kingsbury Toll Road, he spied some movement off in the bushes. Hank's a smart man. He knew what he was in for. So he took his flask of whiskey, poured it over his hat, down the front of his shirt, and slumped down in his seat as if he was in a drunken stupor. And he eased his coach forward slowly. Now, sure enough, that bandit stepped out from behind that bush, 
halted Hank's stage, took one look at Hank and said, there's no contest there, and he proceeded back towards the stage full of passengers. Now, just after he passed Hank, Hank reached under a seat, grabbed an iron bar, raised it above his head, and with one swoop, knocked that bandit out cold. And in his classic Hank Monk drawl, he turned to his stage of passengers and said, All right now, you and the bullion is safe, but that bandit cost me the last of my whiskey. <laughs> Hank had a sense of humor. Well, I've known many stage drivers. Some have had nothing but good find them, and some have had nothing but bad. But old Frank Walker had something completely different finding him. Now, Frank Walker was driving the southbound stage out of Genoa one night when smack dab in the middle of the road stood a Union soldier in full dress uniform. It was too late. Hank, Frank couldn't stop the stage, and he ran that soldier straight through. When he pulled his team over to the side and halted them, he turned to look behind him, and no one was there. What the ghost of a Union soldier be doing on a foothill road in Carson Valley. Well, perhaps the sad story of a company of soldiers who left one of theirs behind might help to tell this story. You see, back in the time when mining was at its height here in Carson Valley, and the war between the states was imminent, there was a Confederate mine at the south end of Carson Valley. And they was always raising a ruckus, trying to get everyone to secede from the Union. So the newly established Fort Churchill sent out a company of soldiers to help keep the peace in the valley. And in the winter of that year, when this had been accomplished, they were called back to Fort Churchill. However, they left one of theirs behind. He was stationed at the base of Horse Thief Canyon. And when this soldier realized what had happened, he began to walk back towards the nearest town on foot. He never made it, however. He was found a few days later, face down in the road, frozen solid. So over the years, wagon drivers, stage drivers, have thought they have run over this soldier, but when they stop to help the apparent victim, no one is there. Now, I think ghosts was attracted to old Frank because the ghost of the Union soldier ain't the only ghost he ever seen. No, sir, no, ma'am. One night, Frank was driving back from Markleyville, and he was, he was coming home to Genoa, and all of a sudden, his team of four stopped in the middle of the road. They raised their heads, they perked up their ears, and all four of them turned to look off to the right. Frank followed their gaze, and what he saw off in the distance was a cabin. And next to that cabin was a woman in a long white gown with long flowing blonde hair waving in the breeze. And she was pointing towards the back of that cabin. Well, faster than you can say, Jehoshaphat, Frank cracked his whip over his team and he sent them a bolton. Frank wasn't afeard of seeing a woman. Oh, he was afeard of seeing clean through her. And after some careful and discreet inquiry, Frank found that a husband and wife had been living in that cabin. And the husband told his neighbors that his wife had gone off to California eh, one day and simply never returned. You be the judge. Well, I drove all over the West. I drove in the Sierras, I, I drove around San Francisco and down to Santa Cruz and, and, and Soquel, California. I drove in Nevada, I drove over Carson Pass. I enjoyed driving and I enjoyed coming into a town and, and whenever I'd come into a town, children would come running out and I always had candy for them. I always gave them candy. And then sometimes, sometimes, I would come into a town and some men had been sitting there placing a bet that old Charlie couldn't line up his wheels of a stagecoach to drive over a silver dollar. Well, the prize was if old Charlie here could line up the front and back left wheels of his stage, 
and run over that silver dollar. He got to keep it. Came in handy in the saloons, I'll tell you that much. But after so many years of driving in the cold and the rain, rheumatism finally set in. And uh, does with, much, with many of the passengers. It, it's what finished Hank Monk in the end. So at the age of 54, I decided to retire to a little form, farm down near Soquel, California. Why, well, raised me some chickens and some cattle, did me some lumberjacking. I also got involved in the community. I joined the International Order of Oddfellows, Lodge Number 137. Stellar group. We used to meet in a little room above D.J. Cummins' store. D.J. Cummins, he, he was a character. He weighed about 375 pounds. Yeah, he sat near the door for every lodge meeting. I believe we was the only lodge that had a bouncer. Well, never was much on politics and voting. I used to listen to people jaw about it while they sat in the box next to me. But it was my fellow lodge members that convinced me of the importance of voting in the 1868 U.S. presidential election between some uh, yahoo from New York named Seymour and, and uh, General Ulysses S. Grant. Glad I'd done it. Glad I cast my vote. I believe my vote helped to elect the right man. Good to have folks looking out for you, ain't it? Sure it is. Well, along about uh, 1879 at Christmas time, I hadn't been seen around town for some time. So my fellow lodge brothers came and looking for me. They came out to my cabin and they knocked on my door, but I didn't answer. You see, I, I was gone. I was gone to meet my maker. It was cancer of the tongue and the throat which got me in the end, probably from smoking them cigars and chewing tobacco and drinking whiskey. But being the good fellers that they were, they wanted to give me a real nice send-off. So they called in the local undertaker to prepare my body for this auspicious occasion. And that's when they found the secret that I'd kept nearly all my life. You see, folks, Old Charlie here is really a woman. Charlotte is my given name. Well, after they recovered from what must have been the shock of their lives, they started looking around for answers. They found the red trunk with the baby clothes. That's a deep sorrow I never talk about with another living soul. <laughs> And I ain't about to start now. Well, they gave me the grandest send-off that any lodge member could ever hope for. But still they wondered who I really was and why I done it. Well, all right, folks, I'll tell you. You see, I was raised in an orphanage. And the only good thing that ever come from that is my love for horses. I loved horses more than I loved most people. So... When I ran away, I disguised myself as a boy. Well, they never would have hired me if they'd known I was a girl. And I eventually became an excellent driver. And in 1850, when Jim Birch of the Pioneer Stage Line came out to Rhode Island where I was working, he was looking for good horses and good drivers. And he hired me to drive through the gold fields. Shortly after I was here, though, I, I learned that the California Mustangs were not as well behaved as the horses back in the old states. I was bent over. I was shoeing one of my horses. And the next thing I knew, I woke up on Doc Benton's table with a brass band going off in my head. I was in so much pain. And I made my way over to the looking glass. And I soon realized that if I didn't wear this patch, I would be called Cockeyed Charlie for the rest of my life. Now, Jim Birch, being the good man that he was, he said, I would always have a job with the Pioneer Stage Line, but my driving days were finished. Couldn't abide by that. I could not. The only thing I ever wanted to do was drive a stagecoach. It was the only thing I knew how to do. So I was determined to teach myself to drive again. I started with two up. I won't lie to you, we had some interesting accidents. Graduated to four eventually, and then up to six up horses. 
and I drove my route ten times in a row without incident and felt that I could approach Jim Birch and ask for my driving job back. He was reluctant, but he agreed to meet me the next morning at the stage office. But when we arrived, it was raining, cats and dogs, pigs and frogs, and anything else the weather could throw at us. And Jim said maybe we ought to wait for another day, but I told him, I said, I wasn't worth my salt as a driver if I couldn't drive in any weather. So reluctantly, Jim climbed up into the boot next to me, and I took the reins. And I'm proud to say we made it to the end of my route in record time. And of course, got my job back. Now folks, what I want to tell you here is that you can do whatever you want to do. There'll be sacrifices at plenty. But if you're determined enough, you will find a way. And I'll leave you with this other little bit to chew on. I consider myself very fortunate to be amongst the life, the likes of Melissa Corre, that first woman to pass over the Sierra. What is my first, you're asking? Well, I was the first woman to cast a vote in a U.S. presidential election 52 years before we was given the right to do so. So there you have it, folks. That's my story. And when you're able to come visit Carson Valley, I hope you'll seek me out and I can take you on my stagecoach to all the places we talked about. But in the meantime, I want you to stay safe, be kind to each other, and don't forget, Carson Valley is the gem of Nevada. Thank you very much.